go before the Lord in prayer one more time before we begin the message here today. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for your love and your grace. God, we thank you for your word here this morning. We ask that you would speak to us through it, Lord. Help us to know it, to believe it, to understand it, to practice it in our lives. Thank you, Jesus, for all that you do. We pray this in your precious name. Amen. Please turn with me with your Bibles to first, or excuse me, Second Timothy. So we used to say First Timothy. Second Timothy, chapter one. We're going to be looking at verses eight through eleven here this morning. Second Timothy one, eight through eleven. And as we talked about last week, Timothy needed encouragement. He needed to be reminded of the divine resources that God had given and equipped him with for ministry. And if you look back at verse 7, Paul says that God had supplied Timothy and all believers with power, love, and discipline. And because of that, Timothy did not need to be fearful about the tasks and about the challenges that were ahead of him. Because it wasn't going to be anything about Timothy, anything that he could do himself that was going to change anything. It was going to be God's work in and through him that was going to be the force, was going to be the power, was going to be everything that was needed for the church to move forward in the right direction. If he wanted to implement what Paul had previously commanded him to do, it was only going to be because of the grace and the mercy of God, the peace of God, the work of God in the life of Timothy and the other leaders and believers in that church. And so his confidence needed to be directed back to God, not, again, in his own capabilities. He needed to trust that God was going to continue to do a work in and through his people. And so in the verses we're going to examine today, we're going to see more of Paul's encouragement and his argument for why Timothy and any true believer should not be ashamed as we do the work that God has called us to, as we do the work to share the gospel and share our faith and the testimony that God has given us. And just to give you guys a little bit of a heads up, what we're going to be covering today, there's going to be some parts of this that are pretty heavy theologically. So I just want to help you be mindful. If you need to say an extra prayer as I'm preaching, I also ask with my voice, just have a little extra patience for me today. But bear with me, there's a lot of amazing things we're going to look at. Um, so just please follow along as we go. But yes, we're going to dive deep into some, some great things. So let's go ahead and do that as we put, pick up here in verse 8. The Word of God says, 2 Timothy 1, verse 8, Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner. But join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. The word therefore is what Paul uses here first in verse 8. It ties us back to what he has just previously said in verse 7. In light of the fact that Paul has reminded Timothy that he has been given not a spirit of timidity, but a power of love and discipline. And because of that, Paul makes that connection. And he, again, reminds Timothy and all believers that we have no need to be fearful. We have no need to be timid in our calling. And then Paul goes on here in verse 8 and says, We should also not be ashamed of the testimony of the Lord, Paul says, of me, his prisoner. And remember, again, as I said last week, the couple of things that were going on, um, there was a lot of persecution that were, was taking place here. For the church, Christians were heavily being persecuted for their faith. And then as you think about what Paul was facing as he wrote this letter, he was in prison and he was about to be executed. <coughs> so there was a great temptation because of everything that was going on for people to shy away from sharing the gospel. Right When there's pressure on people to lose their livelihood or their, their lives, People can be timid. People can be afraid, right? That's understandable. But Paul is encouraging Timothy to not be timid, to not 
be ashamed. And the same would be true for all of us, regardless of some of the complications or difficulties that may come as a result of us being faithful. We need to continue to follow the Lord and be obedient. And there would have been many that would have been ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, as Paul says here. Because they didn't want to be like Paul. They didn't want to end up like him in prison, about to be executed. And Paul had also already experienced those who were ashamed and who had walked away from him and the Lord in order to avoid a similar end. But what did Jesus say? Just listen as I read from the Gospel of John. John 15, in verse 18 and following, Jesus says, If the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. They hated Jesus without cause. Jesus did nothing wrong. He only ever told the truth in love with grace. And they murdered him. Why do we think we should be treated any better? Or that we will be treated any better? Because we won't. And again, this is exactly what Jesus said. Jesus says they're going to hate us. They will persecute us. And so this should be no surprise. And there are frankly tons of passages in Scripture that talk about suffering. Turn with me to Philippians chapter 1, just very briefly. Keep your finger in there. And Timothy, but turn to Philippians. Philippians chapter 1, listen to what Paul says in verse 29. He says, For it has been granted to you, for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. Typically, when we think of suffering, we don't think it's a good thing, especially as a Christian, right? That's not something we think is good, typically, anyway. But according to Paul here in Philippians 1, it is a gift from God that has been granted to us, just like our faith. That's what he said, right? For to you it has been granted, for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer. So it's a gift that God has given us. And so we need to respond just as we would with any other gift, any other good gift, especially, that we would receive. And again, we see plenty of examples of this in Scripture. One in particular, again, you don't have to turn there, just listen. In Acts chapter 5, verse 41, the disciples had been flogged for proclaiming Christ, verse 41 says, so they went on their way from the presence of the council rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. So the disciples, the apostles, they considered themselves to be worthy that they could also suffer for the name of Christ. And that's something that we need to do as well. So again, Peter was among the, one of the people who was flogged in Acts chapter 5 here in verse 41, and he's rejoicing, and then turn to 1 Peter chapter 4, and look what he says. This was someone who obviously had plenty of first-hand experience with this. 1 Peter 4, starting in verse 12, Peter says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing as though something strange were happening to you. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that also at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice in exaltation. For if you were reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Make sure that none of you suffers as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or a troublesome meddler, 
But if anyone suffers as a Christian, he is not to be ashamed, but is to glorify God in this name. So it's very clear, again, this is just a small sampling of texts, passages in Scripture that tell us that not only are we going to suffer as Christians, not only are we going to be persecuted for our faith, but that we need to rejoice in that suffering. And again, that is not an easy thing to do. But by the grace of God, through the Spirit of God in us, this is something that He has enabled us to do. This is something that we can do. And the other great news is we don't have to do this alone. We have the body of Christ together. That we can pick each other up. We can encourage each other. We can help each other when we're suffering. And so again, as Scripture tells us, we need to rejoice when we suffer as Christians. And we should never be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of the Gospel. Romans 1.16 Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. We should never be ashamed of the gospel because the gospel is the power of God that he uses to save sinners like you and me. There is nothing to be ashamed about the gospel. We need to also look back as we see some more words from our Lord in Mark chapter 8, again, just listen along. I know we're looking at a lot of verses here, but they're so important to look at. Mark chapter 8, Jesus said, starting in verse 34, And he summoned the crowd with the disciples and said to them, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel's, will save it. For what profit is a man to gain the whole world and yet forfeit his own soul? For what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in glory of his Father with the holy angels. So as Paul said to Timothy, I say to all of you, don't be ashamed of the gospel. Don't be ashamed of our Lord. Instead, go back to 2 Timothy. Look at the end of verse 8. What does it say? Paul says, we are called to join with Paul and the countless others in Christ and suffer together for the gospel, which Paul reminds us again is according to the power of God. He says, therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. And as I said just a moment ago, we need to remember that we're not in this fight alone. We might individually be facing different things in our lives and challenges and struggles and temptations and suffering. Yes, that's true. But again, like I said, we are a church family. There's other brothers and sisters in Christ in this community around the world that we know that we can have together to gain support for prayer, whatever else it is that we need, but we need to band together as one. We're not in this fight as lone rangers. The Holy Spirit is in everyone who has believed in Christ, who has genuinely repented of their sin. And he is with us he is for us. So we have the body, we have the Holy Spirit, and there isn't anything that God has not enabled us to overcome. We can overcome because of Christ and what he's accomplished for us on the cross. And so, with all that, we need to remember what Paul just got done saying in verse 7. We don't need to be fearful. Because he's given us a spirit of power, of love, of discipline. These are the divine resources that not only Timothy possessed, but every believer has been given by God. And we need to remember these things as we go through life and experience suffering as Christians. When we're persecuted for what we believe, being called bigoted, or whatever else, racist, 
made up word these days almost. Everything is racist. That's what they say anyway. So we need to remember the words that Paul writes here because they should not only just be an encouragement for Timothy, but an encouragement to all of us. So we don't need to be fearful. We don't need to be ashamed because God is greater than all and he has given us everything that we need to accomplish the mission that he has called us to. Now, as Paul tells Timothy these things, he specifically points back to the mighty work of God as one of the main reasons for why we should not be ashamed. And that's what we're going to see in the following verses, particularly in verse 9. And it's this next, word, this next verse here, verse 9, that is by far one of the most insane verses in the entire Bible. I hope I piqued your interest. Because it really is. And this is where it's going to get a little heavier. So like I said, bear with me. Um, we're going to try to take it a little bit at a time. And hopefully we can make sense of it here. Let's read it. Verse 9. Paul says, Who saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. So again, previously Paul says, we're to join with him in his sufferings, in the sufferings of Christ, remembering that the gospel is according to the power of God. It's the testimony of our Lord Jesus Christ. And God in his awesome power is the one who has saved us. He's the one who has called us to this holy calling. He not only strengthened and equipped us for service, he has saved us from our sin. He has saved us from all of our transgressions. If you remember back in our study from the book of Colossians, we see exactly what Jesus did for us. You don't have to turn there, but you can if you want. Colossians 1, 9 and following. Paul says, for this reason, since the day we've heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience, joyously giving thanks to the Father. Here we go. This is what Christ has done for us, who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints of light. He has rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of our sins. God has qualified us. He has transferred us. He has redeemed us. He has forgiven us. He has rescued us. This took the awesome omnipotent, almighty power of God to save sinners like you and me. That's the only way it could ever be done. There was nothing else in this world that could ever save us. Only God could accomplish that. The power of God through the good news of the accomplished work of Christ has taken sinners like you and me completely and forever changed our lives for the absolute better. And that's good news. That's the testimony of our Lord that we have the privilege to share with others. That's part of our mission. That's a part of the Great Commission to go and proclaim the goodness of Christ and what he has done for anyone who believes in him. And we need to remember these things. What reason do we have to be ashamed for a God who would do so much to save us? Don't be ashamed. Remember what Christ has done for you. Christ died so that we could live. The least we could do is live in our life to whatever end to please him, to obey him even being willing to die 
That's what it should come to. To accomplish the work that he has called us to in our lives. God saved us while we were still sinners. He saved us while we were still his enemies. Romans 5, 6 through 11. And part of the reason that he did so was because of the calling that he has placed on our lives. And as Paul says here in 2 Timothy 1, it's not just any calling. It was a holy calling. And we must recognize this and take it seriously. Christ has set us apart. And as we saw at the end of 1 Timothy, our calling was not so that we could simply just have cushy lives and make lots of money and try to make the most amount of money that we can. Our call is to be good stewards of everything that God has given us, especially his word. That is what he has entrusted us with, and that is ultimately the most thing in our life that we need to make sure that we have been managing properly because it is a holy call. God has given us a ministry that he uses us to literally, it's not us, it's the Holy Spirit through us, through the word of God, that he uses to bring people back from death to life. And we're going to see that here a little bit more in verses 10 and 11. But we need to remember and understand that our calling is anything but ordinary. We need to remember that God has saved us and now uses us to accomplish his will in the world. And this is an extraordinary thing. The fact, again, it's a privilege, it's an honor, it's a blessing that we get to take part in the mission of God. We should remember how beyond blessed we are that we can take part in what God is doing to bring salvation to those lost in darkness. But it gets even better because God, as Paul says here, he not only saved us and called us with a holy calling, but he did so, look at the rest of verse 9, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose in grace. <clears throat> Turn with me to Romans chapter 9. We're not going to spend a lot of time here. But you're going to see a theme as we go through just two verses, two passages rather. Romans chapter 9, 10 and 11. Paul is talking about the Israelites and talking about the true descendants of Abraham, those who have faith. And he goes on in verse 10 and he says, And not only this, but there was also Rebekah, when she had conceived twins by one man, our father Isaac. Though the twins were not yet born, and had not done anything good or bad, so that God's purpose according to his choice, would stand, here we go, not because of works, but because of him who calls. It was said to the older, the older will serve the younger. God didn't save us because of anything good or bad that we would ever do. And this was before any of us were ever born. Go to Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3, starting in verse 4. <clears throat> but when the kindness of God, our Savior, and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us. Not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he has poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope 
of eternal life. Jesus did not save us because of anything good or bad that we've done. And here in Titus, he says, not about any deeds done in righteousness. And this covers two aspects. This could be supposed righteousness, which is self-righteousness. So any good that we think that we can do or have done, that's not why Jesus saved us. But the other aspect of that is, is Jesus also did not save us because of the righteous works that we would do once we were saved. He didn't look to see, well, if I save so-and-so, they're going to do all of these amazing things. Now, God knew about all those things, but that's not why he saved us. There was nothing that we did, either good or bad, nothing that we had done in righteousness, whether self-righteousness or through the righteousness of Christ, that God chose to pour out his grace and his mercy upon us. What does Paul say in 2 Timothy? For the reason why he says he saved us, he called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace. Again, all of these things are the reasons for why we should not be timid or ashamed of Christ and his gospel. Because without him, without Christ, we have nothing, and we are nothing, and we would be nothing. And there's literally not one good thing in you or me that moved God to have compassion to save us. That is the consistent testimony throughout all of Scripture. We just looked at a couple of verses. But the Bible makes it very clear. Nothing that we did, either good or bad, is the reason that God saved us. It was purely because of his own purpose, purely because of his grace, purely out of his great love that he had for us. And that's the only reason that anyone is saved. And this is just absolutely astounding. astounding. It's just amazing. Because God was and is not obligated to save anyone. Right? God didn't owe us salvation. We've never earned it. We never could earn it. We've not deserved it. And we never will. So the fact that God even saves one person is an amazing thing. And yet the book of Revelation says at the end of time, when we look to see all the redeemed, it's going to be a number that no one can count. It's so high. Think about that. God didn't have to save one individual, and yet he saves a number that is so high that he can't even count it. How great is our God? He's awesome. But again, it wasn't because of anything in us. It was because of his own purpose, because of his grace that he decided to give us. So how can we be ashamed of God? How can we be ashamed of God who would pour out that kind of love and compassion? And that's what Paul reminds Timothy here. Again, the Bible repeatedly says over and over that there's no one good other than God. Romans 3, 10 through 18. What, what did God see when he looked at us before we were ever created, before time? ever began? What, what did he see in man? And then how did that, what did that look like as it actually played out? Well, we're told again in many different passages, but Genesis 6-5 is a good example of that. God looked out and he saw that all of man's thoughts and thoughts of his heart were evil continuously, always. Wicked, <coughs> sinful, and yet, because of God's purpose, because of his grace, because of his love, he chose to save people like you and me. He chose to have mercy on us anyway. That's awesome. <coughs> it, it, it's just mind-blowing. 
Again, while we were still sinners, while we were still his enemies, Christ died for us. How can you be ashamed of that? God decided that despite our utter wickedness, despite our complete wretchedness, that he would set his love on us, even though we deserved his wrath. This is the God that we serve. Again, it's amazing. Again, only God could overcome sin, death, and Satan by giving his beloved son to exchange his perfect life of righteousness for our miserable life of horrific God had saved us. He called us, not according to anything good in us, but solely because of his grace, his goodness, according to the kind intention of his purpose in the world. Well, that's good news, right? Right? Is anyone yeah. laughing? That's good news. Yeah. But it gets even better. Okay? We're not done yet. You know what I think? Well, I've heard this before. Great. I'm glad we're all on the same page. But what we're about to see, you may not have heard before. So this is where you need to buckle down. Be dialed in. Okay? We're going to get into a little bit of the weeds. But like I said, please just bear with me. Paul says that God's purpose for choosing to save and the grace of that he had determined to give us, listen, the end of verse 9, grace and God's purpose, Paul says, was granted in, uh, or was granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. Like you said, this part of the verse is probably one of the most mind-blowing statements in all of Scripture. And I'm going to explain why in just a minute. The matchless, undeserved, and unearned grace of God was granted to sinners like you and me. Grace by itself is, as I just said, it's undeserved, it's unearned. Okay? We got that, right? Everyone's clear on it. But God did not want us to miss it here. He wanted it to be crystal clear for us. Because the grace of God was not something that could ever belong to us. Apart from God granting it to us in the first place. Okay, so, so there's this, this understanding that we need grace... And we can't possess it by ourselves because it's unearned and undeserved. And so in order for us to actually receive that grace, God had to act. God needed to grant us that grace. It needed to be given to us so that that grace could be realized in our lives. Because it's one thing to know about what somebody needs, and it's another thing to take what you know that they need and actually accomplish it, actually make it happen. And that's what God did when he granted it to us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. God knew that the absolute only way that we could ever be saved was by his grace. But as I just said, that knowledge was just one part of it. He had to act in order for us to receive the grace that he had planned to give us. And that's exactly what he did when he granted it to us in Christ Jesus. God's purpose and his grace was not simply granted to us at some point in our life or even right before we were born. And that's also something that we're going to get into here. It's very important that we understand that. It's not, well, we receive salvation and boom, here we go. We receive God's grace. Yeah, there's a part of that 
that takes place in that moment, sure. But it wasn't just at the moment of salvation or before we were born. No, God's purpose and grace for saving us was granted to us in Christ Jesus, what does Paul say? From all eternity. God's eternal purpose to save sinners like you and me and the grace that was needed to accomplish this in order for it to be carried out in our lives was always in the mind of God as a part of his plan. And that's right there what makes my mind turn to mush. The grace that God had planned for everyone who believes he has given it to us from all eternity. It was always in his mind as a part of his plan. Matthew 1.21 says that Jesus would save his people from their sin. Well, when did he choose to enact this plan specifically? Was it right before he came to this earth? No, it was much earlier than that. Again, even in Genesis we see in Genesis 3.15, God promised the correction, the cure for the curse. But it was actually even before that. It was tremendously earlier than when sin entered the world. Because God's plan of redemption was not something that he simply reacted to after the fall. But it was a part of his eternal purpose that existed with him long before the world was ever made. Revelation 13a, you can turn there at some other point. It's kind of a, a complex uh, verse with a lot going on in that passage, so I'm not going to have you turn there now. But, but part of what we see in that verse is that before the foundation of the world, there's this book of life of everyone who is and ever will be saved. The names of everyone who will receive salvation, our names were in that book before the world was ever created. It wasn't just right before the creation because Paul says in 2 Timothy 1.9 that God's plan that he enacted, his purpose to grant us his grace, to save us and to call us, this took place from all eternity. So some of you maybe already got the point I'm trying to make here, but for those of you who haven't, just bear with me just a bit longer. What, what exactly does this all mean? Well, again, think about it for just a second. How long has God existed? Forever, right? God is eternal. God has no beginning or end. He has always existed. He has been there from all eternity. It's infinite. No beginning, no end. So God's purpose and his grace, which he grants to everyone whose name is recorded in the book of life, has always been in God's always been with God as a part of his perfect plan forever. Now, again, I may have lost you. I told, I warned you we were going to get in the weeds a little bit here, right? But if you truly think about what Paul is saying here, this is insane. Because God's plan, his purpose, his grace that he grants to us, everyone whose name is recorded in the in the book of life. If that is your name, if your name is in the book of life, you have been granted God's grace from all eternity, which means from the, all the time that God has existed, which is forever, that's been in the mind of God. You have been in the mind of God. That he had purpose to save you, to love you. Always. And I just find that absolutely incredible. 
And some of you may be thinking, you know, I, I get it, or some of you may be thinking, I don't understand what you're trying to say. And that's okay. Like I said, this is a complicated passage. And maybe I'm making it more complicated than what it actually is. And if I am, I apologize. That's not what I'm trying to do. But I think if we truly look and see what Paul is saying, and we look and think about all the things that we've talked about previously, we have no reason to be arrogant or conceited. Right? We talked about that at the end of First Timothy. We have no reason to be timid or afraid or ashamed when we think about who our God is and what he's done for us. Because this is amazing stuff, guys. No one here, including myself, deserves anything good from God, period. And yet the grace that was needed to save us was granted to us, was gifted to us, was given to us by God in Jesus Christ, in the mind of God always, from all eternity. And like I said, I think about that, and I just can't even process it. I can't even truly fully imagine that a sinner like myself would be in the mind of God that he would set his love and pour out his grace on me from for forever. Again, if we truly grasp this truth, what should that do for us as Christians? What kind of response should we have to this kind of love, this kind of grace. I would just encourage you to think about that and how that should affect you in your own life. And these are just things that, again, Timothy needed to be reminded of. He needed to not be ashamed of the gospel. And we need to not be ashamed as well. Look with me as we briefly look at verses 10 and 11. Paul says, But now has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who abolished death and brought life and mortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher. So God's purpose and his grace, which he granted to us in Christ Jesus from all eternity, has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ. When he came to this earth, when he died specifically on the cross, God's eternal plan of redemption was put on full display. And all that he had spoken about was now starting to see its fulfillment in Jesus and everything that he has and will continue to do. God saved us and called us to a holy calling because Jesus has accomplished the plan of God the Father when he abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And again, this is the good news that we have all received. This is the good news that we should all be living in our lives. And so we need to press on and not be ashamed because God has done some amazing things. God's grace is greater than all of our sins. And God will continue to do incredible things among us in and through his faithful servants. Paul was obviously one of them, and he says, for which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher. And to some degree, even if you don't have these official titles like Paul had, this is true of us, as we've all been commissioned to go and make disciples. You don't have to specifically be a pastor, a preacher, a teacher, an apostle, in order to be a good steward of God's word, with what we've been entrusted with, we just need to not be ashamed. We just need to not be timid. We need to remember who our God is, who we serve, and the power of God that he's given us to accomplish his will in our lives. Everyone is not called to serve the way that Paul was, and that's okay. We just need to be reminded, like Timothy needed to be reminded, we needed to see what Timothy needed to see, that God has saved us, that he has called us with the holy calling to go and proclaim his word. So we need to not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord of the gospel. Rather, we need to join with Paul and embrace suffering if we should ever have to endure it. We need to do so with joy. 
you so much for your word here this morning. And Lord, I know that there was a lot here that was said that was very complicated. Um, some people probably could think that it was said too much. They got it the first time. I understand that, but Lord, sometimes when we hear things multiple times, it, it helps allow things to sink in a little bit deeper. And so God, I just pray that as we reflect on these truths, as we think about your grace, your purpose, that you chose to save us, even when we were sinners, even when we had done nothing good or bad, and without you we would only continue to go from bad to worse. Lord, help us to rejoice and be grateful for what you've done. Help us to remember your love. Help us to remember who you are and all that you are capable of. And that we would put our confidence in you as we go and share our faith, as we go and share the gospel, Lord, that we would not be ashamed, we would not be timid or fearful. Lord, please forgive us. Please embolden us. Help us to love and encourage one another with these words. Thank you, Jesus, for all that you've done. We pray this in your precious name.